Hello, I'm Karen Pascal. I'm the executive director of the Henry Nouwen Society. Welcome to a new episode of Henry Nouwen, Now and Then. Our goal at the Henry Nouwen Society is to extend the rich spiritual legacy of Henry Nouwen to audiences around the world. Each week, we endeavor to bring you a new interview with someone who's been deeply influenced by the writings of Henry Nouwen, or perhaps even a recording of Henry himself. We invite you to share the daily meditations and these podcasts with your friends and family. Through them, we can continue to introduce new audiences to the writings and the teachings of Henry Nouwen and remind each listener that they are a beloved child of God. Now, let me take a moment to introduce today's guest. Today on this podcast, I have the pleasure of interviewing Lisa Harper. Lisa is a pastor with a great strength for encouraging her audiences through wit, authenticity, and biblical wisdom. She's a theological scholar and a wonderful, very funny, gifted communicator. I love how Max Lucado describes Lisa Harper, one of the best Bible tour guides around. She's written 12 books, including A Perfect Mess, Why You Don't Have to Worry About Being Good Enough for God. Lisa, you are known for combining solid biblical teaching with comedic wit and masterful storytelling. I see some of this reflected in the titles of your books, books such as The Sacrament of Happy, Untamed, and so many other good ones. Lisa, would you please introduce us to the Jesus you know? Oh, my goodness. Um, He's so kind. Karen, so, so, so compassionate, so kind, so accessible. Yeah, I grew up in church. Um, my dad left us when I was a, a little girl, um, five years old. And I think like most kids who experience divorce, you think it's at least partly your fault. I thought if only I'd been prettier or you know, use my inside voice more, maybe dad wouldn't have left. And it was soon after my father left us that my mom took us to a different church because where I grew up, you know, divorce was uh, gossip disguised as prayer request. And so she didn't feel comfortable in our old church. We went to a new church and I can remember it like it was yesterday. This was 50 years ago. I'm 57. And um, the preacher started talking about how our heavenly father is a God um, who doesn't walk away from his children. He's not a father who walks away from, from his children. And I remember just being so compelled by the idea that I could that I could have a dad who didn't leave me, that I gave my heart to Jesus. And so, you know, I've been walking with Jesus since I was a kid, but I for decades didn't think he liked me very much. Huh. I thought God had sent Jesus to deliver me from my sins, but the idea that that he was an accessible God who actually who actually loved me, um, I, that was just, that was kind of a fairy tale. It was too good to be true. And he has been, you know how Psalm, Psalm 23 says that, that mercy and goodness will follow us. He has been so graciously relentless in his pursuit of me that I just, I'm undone by his kindness from walking with, with God for 50 years. And if I had one word to describe Jesus, it would be kind. Oh, I love that. I love that. And I identify with that, too. I lost my father at six. My father died. Oh, I'm sorry. But it was interesting. It became real to me that I had a heavenly father who would not abandon me. Mm -hmm. So I get Mm -hmm. that. I understand it. And you have to know how generous and, and as you say, kind God is that he breaks through Mm. into that child's heart and mind and lays a foundation of of relationship that is counter to whatever you've experienced as a child. That's amazing. Uh, One of the things that I received for Mother's Day this year is I received this wonderful little book, Life, an obsessively grateful, (laughs) undone by Jesus, genuinely (laughs) happy and not faking it through the hard stuff of life. The title says so much about who you are and what you have to offer. You're funny and you're witty and you're authentic and you're all these different things. What a treat. You have spoken not just to me and not just to my daughter, but to my granddaughters. They happen to enjoy oh, you. So I, I just want you to know you're kind of generationally linked oh, to all of us. Oh, my goodness, Karen. That's so, so kind. I can't believe that. I'm always surprised, um, gratefully surprised that God has allowed me to both hold a microphone and a pen and talk about him. Because, you know, I grew up thinking you had to have it all together. You know, you had to have a matching sweater set and a quilted Bible cover and, 
you just had to, to really be above reproach. And I am more of a hot mess. You know, I can tell you more stories about where I've gotten it wrong and God has redeemed me. And I'm not trying to act like sin is no big deal. I told somebody the other day that if sin was no big deal, Jesus could have just done, um, he could have just done, you know, gone to after school detention, wouldn't have had to go to the cross. Sin is a big deal. So I'm not trying to make light of the sin in my life or mistakes I've made. But I just, it took me so long to really believe that perfection wasn't a prerequisite for relationship with God. And so the fact that I get to tell stories about Jesus, I'm, I'm still pleasantly surprised anybody besides my mom reads them. How did you get past that perfection being a, uh, a prerequisite? Mm-hmm. Take us on that route. Yeah, God's patience. I I was really dutiful. Like I said, I didn't believe that God could delight in me when I was younger. I, I knew he had saved me from my sins, and I believed as best I could as a kid that he, was, that he wouldn't abandon me, although I certainly struggled with abandonment issues on into my teen and um, early adult years. <clears throat> but I think it was just being honest about my own life. You know, when I when I was really honest about, boy, I keep, struggling or um, I was very attracted to abusive men when I was younger because I kind of creases of molestation on my heart and and so that was a that that was a real draw for me. And so when I would get free of yet another toxic relationship, I would think, oh my goodness, God just keeps pulling me out of pits that I've dug myself, you know, and carrying me to a new place. And so it was really his grace that enabled me to kind of let go of my own preoccupation with performance. Um, I, um, Thomas Chalmers writes about the expulsive power of the new affection. And he talks about how the closer you get to Jesus, that that intimacy with Jesus, our desire to really, and you know, Henry Nowen talks about it so amazingly, our oneness with Christ, our, our intimacy with Christ. Um, well, as you get closer to Jesus, that love for Christ crowds out the lesser affections. And I think that's what happened with me. Just the more and more I believed Jesus, the more I actually leaned into his affection. You know, I tried for so long to be a dutiful kid, to do the right thing, but I had a really hard time just leaning into his embrace. And the more I, the more I kind of leaned into his embrace almost because I collapsed there, the more it was like, oh my goodness, he doesn't he doesn't need me to be a good kid. And he's not looking for my fruit. He's looking for my faith. And um, I heard Tim Keller say recently, and it really resonated with me, he was talking about the man in Mark's gospel who says, you know, I believe that help me in my unbelief because he's so overwhelmed, you know, worried to death that his son isn't going to make it. And he said that, it's helplessness, not holiness, that is the first step to accessing intimacy with God. And man, it took me a long, long, long time to get there. But I think I finally failed enough to go, I'm going to quit dancing for the approval of others, and I'm just going to trust that He actually loves me. You know, He didn't just come to deliver me, He came because He delights in me. And honestly, it's it's Henry now, and it's a few writers that would write about intimacy with Jesus with such authenticity. You know, they didn't write like, here's an acrostic and do the supplication. It was so much more about spiritual formation and our internal life with God. They became my, my tutors. I love to read. And so as I began reading things, I think I began realizing, oh, I'm not the only one. You know, I have this ache for intimacy with God. And that I'm such a mess and I'd read like the inner voice of love and I'd go, oh, like this is true. So he's, God has been so patient with me. It's interesting because um, when you'd mentioned the inner voice of love, I went back to read it again myself and I was just, it's a mm. feast. Oh, I want to recommend it mm. to everybody who's listening. And, and on the back it says, this is Henry Nowen's secret journal. 
It was written during the most difficult period of his life when he Mm -hmm. suddenly lost his self-esteem, his energy to live Mm -hmm. and work, his sense of being loved, even his hope in God. And although Mm -hmm. he experienced excruciating anguish and despair, he was still able to keep a journal in which he wrote each day a spiritual imperative to himself, which emerged Mm -hmm. from his conversations with friends and supporters. And those spiritual imperatives, Mm -hmm. they're short, but each one is just a a feast of truth. And Henry had to just realign everything in him. He was crushed. But he came back and he Mm -hmm. he, he just came to this... um, I I often see this image of him being someone who had a a pendulum in him but when the pendulum came to center it was really on Jesus and that's that's how mm-hmm. he functioned but this book is full of just wonderful imperatives um the other thing that's kind of interesting about that time in his life you know we often think that's the most unproductive time in our lives you know and we're really down mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well this book in itself is is probably one of the finest books that Henry wrote, and it took about five or six years before it was shared because it was so personal. And and the other thing that got started during that incredibly lost and desperate time that he was going through was The Return of the Prodigal Son, which is his classic, probably most read book by Henry Nowen. So it's interesting how our dark places, our down places, are places where we actually, God's there and not surprised at all. Right, Anna, and I love that you said in, in some ways our most our most fruitful places. Yeah. And I do think our culture tends to equate spiritual success with you know with some type of other success, whether it be you have a platform or you have uh, commercial success. <clears throat> and uh, several you well Goodness, now it's been 13 years ago. Um, Karen, I was, I just went through a really, really, really dark season where I, I lost two relationships. My father died and I was diagnosed with cancer, which ended up being not that big a deal, but it presented initially as being a big deal. And I, I just had always been able to pull myself up by my bootstraps. So I would teach grace. But I, I've had a hard time living it. You know, it's kind of like wet soap. I couldn't hang on to it. And it was during that season where I felt, goodness gracious, like I just could barely put one foot in front of the other. And God said to me so clearly, I don't think I've ever heard God's audible voice, but you know, when you hear him so loud, it may as well be audible. And he said, Lisa, you've been running from fear your whole life. I'm going to take you to the basement and I'm going to sit there with you in the dark until fear doesn't own you anymore. Wow. And you know, I'd already been to seminary my first go around. I had a master's in theology. I knew just enough Greek and Hebrew to be dangerous. You know, I'd been in vocational ministry for 20 years, but I mean, I, I just hit rock bottom. And it was during that season, not unlike what, what Henry describes. I'm not saying I went through as much grief as he did. You know, that's all relative. But it it was my own dark night of the soul. And it was about six months of, I mean, I just, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning without saying the name Jesus out loud. I had to speak his name to kind of give my my heart just enough oomph to to swing my legs over the side of the bed. And I've never been, uh, you know, I've always been kind of one of those, good girls. I push through. Even if I'm sick, I'd take a Tylenol and go volunteer at the homeless shelter. I've I've never been classically weak. And I think that was one of my biggest, really one of my biggest failures as a Christ follower was I didn't know how to be needy with God. And I wasn't honest about places where I was really, really broken. And it was that, that really dark season that changed the topography of my heart. I um, That's when I feel like I really learned to be honest with the Lord, to lean into the embrace of Jesus. I didn't have anything to bring to the table. You know, I couldn't say, here's my potential, breathe on it, Holy Spirit. I had no potential. And he just brought vibrancy out of void. He's so kind. So knowing that that he wrote this in one of those seasons where he, from what I understand, he didn't expect it to be published. And yet, boy, it, it has encouraged 
I would imagine, millions of people at this point. Yes, it's, it's interesting because I think it was people who had gone through valleys, his dear friends who shared those passages, who went, this is really mm-hmm. good. This is important. Mm-hmm. This will help others. And so mm-hmm. they persuaded him to bring it out. You know, sometimes you wonder if the intimacy of your struggle is just too raw and too private. Right. But right. in a way, uh, it goes back to being the wounded healer. You can put your wounds out there and realize they can right. help others. Take us back on the recovery journey, to, because I bet you have shared that with many. What What did God give you at the bottom of that valley that has never, mm. you know, never left you? What, what What's there that yeah. you've learned? You know, I, th- I think what I, and I, I won't even go so far as to say I've learned it. I, you know, I'm so, I'm not fixed. I'm freer than I ever had the faith to pray for. But I feel like I'm still in the procession of learning so many things about God. What I began to learn is that His presence, satisfies my soul more than answers do. And, I, you know, some of the places I was wounded when I was a kid, I I was pretty self-protective. I presented as the super friendly extrovert, but I was hiding, you know, a, a lot of pain. And I would think, if only I could figure this out, or if only I could get the answer to this, thinking almost that life was, you know, kind of linear. Like, if I get to this point, I won't have sorrow anymore. I won't have anxiety anymore. And he just has gently tutored me to the place of beginning to understand it really isn't about getting my questions answered. It's about being satisfied in his presence. And he really is enough. I mean, Karen, I think there was a corner of my heart, even in my, I'd say, 30s and early 40s, 40s, where I was an emotional agnostic. And so I could, you know, spout all kinds of theology but there was a corner of my heart that was really afraid that God, two of two things. One was that I wasn't good enough for God. The second one was that maybe God wasn't enough for me. If all I had was God, would I actually be have hope and be satisfied? I thought I needed somebody with skin on. And um, he, in that season where, I mean, I had nothing but God, His presence was enough, and more than enough, more than I had ever hoped for. And that's what I feel like he continues to teach me. You know, I got to become a mom through the miracle of adoption. I've had my little girl home from Haiti for seven years. She is, I could talk to you for 50 podcasts about her. She's the most (laughs) amazing kid. She's just, of course, all our kids are are miracles. I always say my kid is the most amazing kid in the world, but she's tied with yours. So <laughs> they're, they're all such miracles. That, um, but I tell people pretty often who will talk to me about adoption and oh, they're just can't wait till God gives them their child, or they're pregnant, can't wait, or they're still in fertility and just thinking, if only I could have a child, I'd be satisfied. And I'm like, you know, Missy, second to my relationship with Jesus. Missy is the the greatest thing, greatest gift God's ever lavished me with, but she is not my hope. Missy's not the reason I get up in the morning. Jesus is. And I'm so thrilled I get to be her mama. But, you know, her shoulders can't carry the weight of my emotional expectations. Jesus is the only one who can give me wholeness and that kind of supernatural peace. And I am still learning that. You know, I was hospitalized with covid um, I've been home from the hospital for a month now, and it was, <clears throat> I, had, I had one night when they weren't sure they were going to be able to stabilize me and I overheard some of the medical personnel and realized, you know, I was, I was having a brush with death and I've always been physically strong and, you know, I race mountain bikes and ride motorcycles and snowboard. So I'm a risk taker, but I've never been hospitalized because my body was weak. You know, I might've been in an accident, but it wasn't because I couldn't breathe. And there was a moment that first night when I realized, oh, wow, you know, I'm, I might not get out of here. Wow. And, and it was, it was such a, an interesting thing because I felt such peace with God. And I thought, wow, this is what peace with God feels like. I'm not afraid to die, even though I'm 57. And then, like, right on the heels of that, I found myself telling God what he already knows. 
And I was like, God, Missy's first mama died when she was a baby and she's only 11. And it, it, I don't know if her little heart could handle, you know, being orphaned a second time. And so you can take me whenever you want to take me, but could we just wait until Missy's a little older, until she's a young adult? And, like, and I thought, what in the world are you doing? You, you just doing that. You know, here you just had this wonderful peace with God. You trust him. And on the heels of that, you're telling him what he already knows and essentially telling him, I need you to be good with regards to my daughter. And so I think, you know, for me to ever think I completely grasp something about God, I think the only thing I really hang on to is, he's good and I'm not him, <laughs> you know, um, because the other stuff I feel like in my humanity, I have to relearn, you know, and, and that's why I think being in his word is so important. I think we only get closer to Jesus through the revelation of the Holy Spirit and the revelation through this love story called the Bible. And so apart from his spirit and his word, man, I am, I am kind of a prodigal waiting to happen. <laughs> Well, I, I, you know, I, I gotta say, I, I got bits and pieces of your story, and I love the, the mm. part about Missy. I love that God mm. brought Missy into your life, and I wasn't sure you'd want to talk about the COVID part, but boy, that's right to the edge of life. My goodness! Oh, oh man, it has been. You know, I, I told you I was scared when I was younger. One of the things I was really afraid of, even though I didn't know it and probably wouldn't have admitted it, was intimacy, and so. <clears throat> you know, you can't experience deep intimacy with others unless you've been willing to go there with God. And at least that's my opinion. And I had, you know, <clears throat> been in some not so great relationships. Like I said, I was drawn to abusive men and God protected me from the men I was drawn to. And the few good godly guys I dated, God protected them from me because I was <laughs> hot mess express. And so I got to my early 40s and realized, oh, my goodness. You know, those years when when you are are normal for people to get married and have children, I've missed that window. And I don't think God is at all capricious, but uh, but there are consequences for our sin and our choices. And I realized, my goodness, I've, I've you know, those years that I could have had children biologically, I, I really wasted those years. And I thought, my goodness, I'm not going to get to be a mom. And it's too long a story, but I mean, Karen, it is me getting to be a mom is pure grace. I mean, just pure grace because, you know, I was older, single woman. There's there's adoption agencies that are closed um, to you if you're single. I was, you know, in my late 40s. There's countries, whole countries that are closed to you if you're single in your 40s. And I get that because you want to make sure a child is in a stable environment. But just the way he wrote me in the Missy story and, you know, my little girl wasn't supposed to survive um, because her her mama, who I never got to meet, I, I got woven into the Missy story after her mother passed away. Her first mom, Marie, I cannot wait to meet her in glory <laughs> to look at our girl. Um, <clears throat> but she was very, very sick with AIDS and, and unwittingly. Missy has HIV and she was very, very malnourished and had tuberculosis and had struggled with cholera. I mean, just so many things from a, from a very rural, um, impoverished third world village. And so I wasn't supposed to be a mom. She wasn't supposed to survive. And God just, I mean, he poured grace on us. And so, I mean, it was a long journey. It was a two year adoption process and it was definitely a, a roller coaster. But I'll look at her sometimes. She just came in from having a little, um, she had a review session today because she's got a test coming up um, for the end of fifth grade. And she's just this, I mean, I'm kind of still in the honeymoon season of motherhood, even though it's been <laughs> seven years, you know, nine years if you count the adoption process. She's just this beautiful, happy kid. Uh-huh. And she just comes barreling in the door, grinning from ear to ear. And she was like, mom, can I have a quesadilla? I'm like, oh my goodness, honey, you can have the whole cheese factory. I mean, she's just, she's just a miracle. But I, I think, you know, I think we are all surrounded by miracles. It's just, it takes God opening our eyes to see them. And I've made every mistake known to motherhood. But the one thing I do well is gratitude. 
because I still can't quite believe that he's redeemed my life to this point. I, I'm so grateful. He's just done so much. And it's, and it's a blast. I mean, I, I wish I had the metabolism of my 20s, you know, and wasn't in stretchy pants all the time. <laughs> That's, that's really my, my main grief, you know. Um, it's just life is, is sweeter than I would have had the faith to pray for. Well, I am so glad. I, that's a that's a wonderful part of your story. I mean, there's so many parts, and I'm going to encourage people after this podcast, go to our website, and, and you'll get links to all the different books mm-hmm. that Lisa's written, and there's ones that you're going to want. Thank now, you. one that she wrote was The Sacrament of Happy. You dismantle yeah. the old school <laughs> idea that joy, not happiness, is the is truly spiritual emotion for the Christian family. And you assert Christian right. followers are actually called to happiness. We're free yeah. to express genuine joy, fulfillment, and contentment, regardless of the personal and global tumult around us. That's, it's interesting to hear that because uh, even your daughter, in a sense, comes out of a what was a tragic situation which the world couldn't mm-hmm. solve, which the world could look on and mm-hmm. grieve. It was so dreadful what was happening there. But Tell me a little bit about the sacrament of happy. I mean, I think, mm. I, I don't think it's just about being funny. Tell us, do you really no, think no, God no. wants us to be happy? Do you really think that? Yeah, I do. I do. I think first you kind of have to go, what do you talk about when you say happy? Because that word itself, you know, the people have very different ideas when they hear that word. And in our culture, that word usually conjures up this image of everything's going great. And that's not biblical happiness. I didn't realize until I started studying the biblical context of happy, you know, our Bibles are saturated with the word happy. It's not usually translated happy in the Old Testament. Um, oftentimes it's translated blessed. And same with the New Testament. The Old Testament in the Hebrew, the word is Asher. In the New Testament, it's Makairos. But the, the, it's an accurate translation to say that word means happy. But it, it's closer to contentment and fulfilled than, than 21st century first world understandings of happy. We understand happy, you know, um, I'm wearing my skinny jeans, you know, I've got plenty of money in the bank and I just got my hair done. You know, so we tend to base happy on happenstance. If your circumstances are going according to your liking, that's not at all how the Bible des- describes happiness. In, in biblical context, it's much more closely related with fulfillment and contentment in God. And so, you know, it's like I, I was studying happiness at the same time, Karen, the Lord impressed me to study the book of Job. And I was like, oh, you're kidding me. I mean, I have avoided Job like the plague, you know, because it just seems like the saddest book. I thought, man, that'll be like sticking your hand in a blender. But I started started studying Job. I spent actually an entire year in the book of Job. And the thing that slayed me was, you know, toward the very beginning of the book in chapter one, and for anybody listening who's not familiar with Job, he's this real guy, um, a historical character in the Old Testament, who loses everything. He loses his business, and he was a very, very wealthy man if he, he were to live Living today, he'd be traded on Wall Street. He loses his entire wealth. He loses all of his children, and he had six children. And he loses um, he loses just everything. He loses his health too. And so I, I can't even get past losing. I can understand losing your wealth. That wouldn't be as big a deal to me. But to lose his sons and to lose his daughters, I just can't even imagine that. And he lost them all in one fell swoop and this tragic accident and when he's grieving that he's really honest about it it says he shaved his head and he tore his robe I mean he's not pretending like everything's okay those were signs of deep grief and that ancient era but in the same verse that it tells us he is grieving it says he fell on the ground and he worshiped and he has this basic understanding that everything I have is from God it's all God's anyway I'm going to trust that somehow, some way, he's good. And so I think, you know, Job gave me a context that helped me to understand that Romans 8, 28 is not hyperbolic. I think Christians throw that phrase, that verse around. Sometimes at very inappropriate times like funerals, 
And that verse is, you know, that God will work everything out according to our goodness, glory for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And it almost sounds like this perky Pollyanna, oh, well, everything's going to be great. And you think, please don't tell me that when I'm grieving the loss of, of a loved one or when I just found out the lump of my breast is malignant. And, and we forget Romans 8, 28 is in the context of the beginning of Romans 8 says, we're going to grieve inwardly, you know, groan inwardly as we grieve because this world is in our home. Kind of like the whole point of the inner voice of love and so many of the other things, the wounded healer that, that um, I always want to say doctor now and I respect him so much that he wrote, can you drink this, this truck, this cup, all those give you the milieu of human suffering. And so, so I think all too often we're taught just pretend like you don't hurt and put on a happy face. And that's not at all what Job does. Job says, I'm dying today. I'm grieving today. I can't handle my circumstances today. But my God is still good. And that's Romans 8, 28. It's you may be groaning today, but God is still good. It's just we're so human. We can't see beyond time and space. And I think that's what Henry Nowen writes about so beautifully is that there's something about not thinking that suffering means God is mad at us. You know, he's not a unibrow librarian waiting to smack us over the head if we step out of line. He is always kind. He is always good. Sometimes life is really hard. And to me, true happiness, biblical happiness, godly happiness is to go... Even in this, my God hasn't abandoned me. You know, I lost two adoption before Missy. And one of those was heart-wrenching because I lost the adoption four days before I was supposed to bring the baby home. And I mean, Karen, I felt like, and I felt like my heart had just been torn in two by, by a sword. I, I wasn't sure. I'd ever be able to get my heart back again in one piece. I was devastated. And it was two weeks after that that I got the call about Missy, asking if I'd be willing to step in the process with Missy. And I don't for a moment think that that adoption loss was divinely causative. There were some just really horrible things around it. Um, So I'm not saying, oh, God took one thing and gave me another. It wasn't like that. But because our God is good, something that was really painful and really um, horrible, and it wasn't as well. It was part of the fall. But he still used that to kind of plow my heart up, to prepare my heart for this two-year journey of adopting a child that doctors told me she didn't even make it through the adoption process, that she would pass away. And so God doesn't – I think most of the pain we walk through – is because of the fall. We live in a broken planet that is marred by sin. But God doesn't waste pain. He's really, really kind. And if the grief he allows us to wade through, if we will accept it, not as, I'm not saying we're masochists and say, oh, please hurt me more. But if we go, okay, I don't understand this. But I'm going to keep my heart in the game and trust that somehow, some way, he'll use this. I think it fuels our compassion, and I think our world, our world needs to know that God is good, and our world also needs to know that people who love God are not going to pretend like they don't hurt. Instead, we're going to be willing to step into a hard place with other people and say, how can I help you? Can I just walk with you as you grieve? I don't think the church has done a very good job at actually walking alongside people who ache. No, I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, And sometimes the only ways that we learn to do that is really come in contact with our own hurt and own it and, and somehow invite God to the depths of those places where we are really hurting. I found that this year, one of the great realities that has in a way surprised us. Uh, you know, we often asked, uh, has Henry got something to offer to today? And what we have been discovering mm. as people have gone through this very, very challenging year where they are limited in so many things, how much the meditations, the words of Henry now and have been a resource, have been a help. And I've been so 
glad that we could offer that. I'm glad that it, his life has a fruitfulness that continues here. It's 25 years since he died, but there's this wonderful fruitfulness in those words. And I think they're fruitful because they're so full of honesty. Oh, absolutely. And I think in some ways, people, like you said, because we've gone through such unexpected pain, I think maybe somebody who 25 or 30 years ago might not have been willing to kind of pull back the veneer of their life and go, boy, I'm really struggling. Today, I mean, you just, all you have to do is open your phone and you see suffering, you see anguish, you see some really hard times. So like, again, you have somebody like me who talks about happy and they go, oh my goodness, you are kidding me. She's going to be a Pollyanna. It's like, no. How do we find peace and contentment and fulfillment when the world as we know it is really difficult? I had um, at the beginning of uh, the pandemic, about six weeks into it, um, um, someone very, very close to me committed suicide. And I mean, Karen, it was like, you know, we were already struggling with the pandemic. We had a hard time. Uh, for a while getting Missy's medicine. I lost a year's worth of work. So like everybody else, I already had kind of the, you know, the, the, the normal disappointment and the concerns. And then all of a sudden this friend took his life and I was just like, goodness gracious. You just feel that almost overwhelming. How do we, how do I step into this? I, I'm, I'm already sad. Now I'm not, I, I just don't really know how to navigate it. And I went back to the wounded healer because I thought if I'm going to in any way help some people of mine who are who friends of mine and and family members who are grieving this loss with me, how how do I stay connected? And, you know, there's that place in the room. Well, there's every word of that book is amazing. But there's that place where he says um, he talks about the tragedy of ministers not being willing to burn their fingers. And I just remember thinking, oh, goodness, because I've been so disappointed in these, in this first month and a half of pandemic, I'm almost in that posture of trying to shield myself from any more hurt or any more disappointment. And then I thought, oh, that's right. I have to be willing to burn my fingers, you know, to get, to get my hands and my heart burnt because that's, that's what we're called to be as as Christ followers, as agents of reconciliation, as wounded healers. And so I think, I mean, I'm only 57 years old, so I'm still wet behind the ears, you know, when it comes to wisdom. But I feel like his books are more pertinent now than ever before. Well, I'm, I am delighted to hear you say that. That that means a lot. It's funny, I look for, uh, interestingly enough, when I, when I became the executive director, I was eager to hear was Henry Nouwen's name still in the spiritual conversations of the day. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say to you that actually I found you because you're you're one of the people that's in the spiritual conversations of the day. And so I think that's a really important thing to realize that you're speaking and we would all rather not have lives that, you know, (laughs) are marked by (laughs) wounds and and marked by mistakes. But somehow when you can take those and you can offer them up because God has come into the midst of them and made himself Mm -hmm. so real in the midst of that, that you have something really wonderful to offer. I I saw a a beautiful quote on the back of your book, um, Untamed, and you wrote, I've like Untamed. This is interesting because it's too many people settle for relating Jesus merely as a comfortable friend and a companion when what we are, we are all need is an untamed savior, a fearless champion, tough enough to conquer our shame and compelling enough Mm -hmm. for us to follow him without hesitation. And you Mm -hmm. write about yourself, I finally realized my caricature of Jesus wasn't big enough to calm my anxiety or heal my wounds or defeat Mm -hmm. the wickedness in our world. Mm -hmm. I I found that so powerful that you chose to be honest Mm -hmm. about that you've had to continue to grow. And that's what I think Mm -hmm. makes it exciting to to come alongside you, Lisa, and see who you are and Mm -hmm. what what you're doing. Uh, Thank you. Well, and you know, Karen, don't you find yourself, like even you go back through and reread, like you're saying, the inner voice of love, and you go, oh, wow, because truth isn't stagnant. You know, because our hearts are always changing and because our understanding of God is 
hopefully growing and maturing and, and vibrant, we go back to truths and go, oh, now I can see another facet. It's like a diamond. You know, you hold it up to light and go, oh, wow, I see a whole other color I didn't see before. And so I, I feel like my, my understanding of, of who God is, is constantly getting bigger. And, and instead of being overwhelmed that I'll never know God completely, I'm so glad he's not such a small God that my finite mind could contain all of his goodness and all of his kindness and all of his mercy. And so that's, that's why, you know, Henry Nowen is one of those writers that to me, the word of God is the most important thing. We've got to, we've got to have our nose in our Bibles. It's not a rule book. It's a, it's a love story, but second to the word of God, there's just a few people I reread on, on an annual basis. I'm constantly going back to their books and those would be, Henry Nowen and Frederick Buechner and C.S. Lewis. There's just a few who I think, boy, they were they were so profound and they were such sharp instruments in the hands of God. I don't think he will ever be irrelevant. Well, I I just want to thank you. Your books are rich; they're a treasure. I'm going to encourage our audiences to take a look and and be sure and pick up a Lisa Harper book, or or you can actually hear Lisa preach. I notice there's lots of sermons online, and she's a real treat. I mean, you got a taste of it today. <laughs> this woman's funny, but funny in a profound sort of a way. And I, I love the fact, Lisa, you've been willing to take those things that scarred you deeply, those things that were intimate and private, and we would all like to hide. You took them out and said, there. Yeah. God met me yeah. there. I feel like the tide has, has shifted some just since I was in my, say, 20s and 30s and first in ministry, that it's mm-hmm. not all about, let me give you an acrostic for how to have a, a successful, productive life. It's more about being honest with each other and being real with God. And I, I again, that's why I'm so, you know, when I first, Karen, started reading Henry Nowen in my, I'd say, probably late 20s, I couldn't understand even what he was saying. <laughs> I just knew I needed it. Yeah. But I was such a poser. I wasn't honest enough to apply a lot of his stuff. But it gave me it gave me something to go, oh, oh. It took me years, I think, to really mm-hmm. uh, oh, I think to and I'm not saying I'm even there yet, but mm-hmm. to begin for my heart to go okay, that's me, or I'm not afraid anymore. I mean, if yeah. you could see my copy of The Wounded Healer, and this is probably <laughs> my 10th copy because I'm always giving it away, it is coffee-stained and wrinkled and just so, you know, yeah. just you, you're like, it looks like it's been hit by a truck because I've just gone back to it time and time again. And you know that in Inner Voice of Love, the control your own drawbridge? Yes. Oh, yes. That changed my life. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is not too strong to say it changed my life because I was such a people pleaser. And I just, I didn't know. I didn't know we were even allowed to control our trumpets. I thought everybody <laughs> came in. And um, that was, that, that continues to be, I continue to use that as I teach, as a, just a framework for here's what that looks like. It doesn't mean you let everybody into the innermost sanctum of your heart. You know, God doesn't say you have to do that. You have wisdom on who you're completely you know, intimate with. But I, I'm just so tickled I got to talk to you today, and I hope to meet you someday face-to-face. So grateful that you took time to meet with us today, and I wish blessing on you and good health as well on you and on Missy. <laughs> May you be well. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. Lisa Harper is so full of wisdom and wit. If you enjoyed this podcast, share it with your friends. And we'd be grateful if you'd take time to give us a thumbs up or a good review. For more resources related to today's program, click on the links on the podcast page of our website. You'll find links to anything mentioned in today's podcast, as well as book suggestions and links to sign up to receive our free daily Henry Nouwen meditations. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, give us a thumbs up, or follow us on social media for more Henry Nouwen content. For books, videos, and other resources, or if you'd like to receive free daily Henry Nouwen e-meditations, you can follow the links below.